Welcome to the Growth Buyer Podcast, where we engage with top business leaders who share their experiences and provide real insights that help them attract customers, retain staff, and grow their bottom line. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi there, I'm Kevin Horrigan, host of the show, where I feature inspiring business leaders from various backgrounds and industries who are willing to share their stories and insights. Today's podcast is brought to you by Spinia Tech. Elaine here at Spinia Tech, we help middle market and larger companies get more leads. Hey, who doesn't want more leads? At Spinia Tech, we take an end-to-end digital approach, starting with your website and making sure it has the right aesthetic appeal and convincing content to convert your visitors into action. And then we look at all your digital marketing tactics, such as search engine optimization, paid search, social media, email marketing, and more. With the correct website and optimized digital marketing campaigns in place, We help our clients attract more qualified leads, grow their existing accounts, and be more successful. To learn more, go to www.spinnytech.com. Well, today's guest is Elaine Boyd, founder of the Workshop Ninja. Elaine is a serial entrepreneur. She grew her social media marketing agency to 600 active clients and sold it in 2018. Her newest company, Workday Ninja, helps companies implement the software needed to effectively manage their operations. Elaine, welcome to the Growth Fire Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Yeah, and before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to Wenel for introducing us and getting us set up on this podcast today. Yeah, th- she's awesome. I'm so glad she got us connected. Yeah, I am too. She is awesome. So thank you. Um, Elaine, tell us a little about yourself, where you grew up, maybe when you were a youngster, what you wanted to do when you became a, into the work environment. Uh, give us a little insight about yourself. Well, throughout this podcast, you are going to hear me drop some y'alls. And so I am from the South. I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, eating crawfish, watching LSU, living the life. And um, I loved growing up there, but I knew my whole life that I didn't want to live there the rest of my life. Yeah. And what I wanted to be was a boss. Wearing, uh-huh. And I wanted to wear cute outfits. That was what I would tell people for a very long time. And, you know, it really didn't matter what I was the boss of other than a company. And so luckily, I just had that entrepreneur gene in me. My dad was an entrepreneur. And, it, you know, I had a few stumbles along the way trying to figure out what I really enjoyed doing, what I didn't, and ended up here today. Oh, that's an amazing story. You know, so often when I ask that question, when we start our podcasts, um, people often, you know, had a vision of what they wanted to be when they were earlier, but, and often their experiences in life change what that vision is, but you didn't define yours. Well, you just wanted to be a boss and you wanted to dress nice. And so that gave you a wide (laughs) spectrum of markets you could go to, Uh, but you're fulfilling your childhood dream. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I really am. Yeah. Yeah. Not many of us get a chance to say that. Um, Elaine, tell me a little bit about your new company and tell us a little bit about the company. And then maybe a follow-up question that is, who's the target market of who you serve with your new organization? Yeah, you know, like you said in the intro about me is I had an agency and two software platforms and I, I grew the agency side to 600 active clients and I got acquired and the company was amazed what you know you always say they look under the hood. They looked right. under the hood and they were just blown away by the amount of work we were doing with the size of the team that I had. Yeah. And so part of the buyout, I got additional but I got an additional buyout lump sum if I stayed on for 18 months and implemented my systems into their organization. Yes. And I agreed. I thought it'd be a good learning experience and why not? And that's when I figured out, you know, I can, it doesn't really matter what the company is. What I really enjoy doing is the operations piece and making things a well-oiled machine. Mm-hmm. And so I was so naive. I sold that company, stayed on, did my part took a little bit of retirement because I was very burnt out, you know, sure. as you can imagine. Sure. And I just thought, you know, the naive part came in. And I was like, I wonder if any other companies want my knowledge on how to build operations, how to use a project management system to yes. keep workflow flowing. And, you know, it turns out that they did. And so I started Workday Ninja. And even when I started the company, I, it really was just such a small idea at the time because I didn't know if I'd get any clients. And I named it BGBO and it stood for biggest goal, biggest obstacle. Hmm. And, you know, I'm going to help you get through your, your biggest obstacle to help you achieve your biggest goal. But people trying to get people to remember BGBO Co. 
was so difficult. <laughs> it was like a tongue twister. The the letters were just like, and I was like, I need to change the name of my company. This is not working. So Workday Ninja is what I've changed it now that I've got, you know, a, a bunch of clients and a team and it works much easier. And I help people become Workday Ninjas. Well, I'm so glad you did tell us what the acronym BGBO stood for, because when you said it, I'm like, hopefully she's going to say what that stood for, because I didn't know what it was going to be. But <laughs> Big, biggest goal, biggest opportunity. So, and so you converted to Weekday Ninja. So, uh, you know, I understand today, you know, you, have a, you help companies be able to find the right softwares to be able to help run their business processes. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and we help, and a lot of them are agencies. So you asked about like our target market and yes. agencies because they've got, it's, it is such a, there's so many things happening in an agency. Yes. And it can yes. be a bit custom in that, you know, you might have certain ser- services that you provide. But every company that they're working with is going to be different. So there is some custom out, you know, customization that has to happen. And so we work with a lot of agencies and they have the pain points, client onboarding, because they're constantly bringing on new clients. Where yes. are, what's the project status? You yes. know, so really helping put in a project management system like Asana or ClickUp or Monday. Those are really big and yes. in agencies. And how to utilize those. Most companies that are using them are very much underutilizing them. The team really isn't all trained the same way. Yeah. You know, they don't have their systems really in there. People are using it more as task management and not project management. Yep. So that's usually the, the base of where we start. It's like, hey, let's get your workflows all implemented, uh, document what they are, and then train your team. And then we start building on top of that. And so, you know, where does your CRM play into it? Well, yes. when you get a one deal, you don't want to have to have a person manually do all the work, creating a drive folder, Dropbox folder, putting them into your Asana account, sending them an invoice. No, all of that can be automated from just a one deal in Pipedrive, you know, yes. or, yes. or HubSpot. Right. So that's where we start building on top of that is, okay, you don't just live in your project management system. You've got other software platforms. How can we make them all work together so things are consistent? Things aren't missed, that the team knows where things are at. And you're not running this chaotic atmosphere for your team. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as an agency owner, I, I mean, like, I don't know if I'm drooling right now, but uh, but you're, you're, <laughs> you know, I think you're, you're speaking to a lot of professional services agencies, but other professional services, too. There is a constant amount of volume going through. And. Um, it's a lot to manage. And, you know, you had 600 active clients with your agency. You know, I think we invoice over 600 companies a month as well. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot going on. And very rarely is there much consistency to it. Every client we have is a unique website solution. Every client we have is a unique marketing mix. And every client we have is a unique customized engagement and customized pricing and things of that nature specifically to their needs. So there is no efficiencies of repeating what you constantly do because what we do for our clients is unique to every one of their circumstances. And so, um, you know, it, it is a, a pain of agencies to um, determine how to take prospects to become customers through invoicing and collections. There's a lot of moving parts and not really an integrated system that does all of that really well. Yeah, and and exactly. And that's why we start using APIs or like Zapier yeah. or Make or something like that, where we can piece it all together. I mean, early in my agency, I had to, I figured all this out because I had, was hitting so many pain points. And so I was like, I got to change these operations here. And, you know, you start, like you mentioned, like clients are on different packages. What right. was sold to them? And you start the account management team is running in circles, trying to figure out what they, the client even purchased, what original package, you know, all of these things. And I was like, I've got to figure this out because this all of this time and chaos is costing me thousands of dollars right. in them trying to figure it out. Lack of, yeah, lack of productivity. And, and that internal time doesn't provide any value back to your clients either, right? You know, we're here to serve yeah. our clients. And that internal efficiency is not helping. It's, it's not helping your organization. It's not helping your clients either. And so, right. you know, what you do is really just helping the people that we employ in our agencies do what they love to do and do less of what they don't like to do, which is a bunch of <laughs> manual stuff that doesn't make sense. Exactly. Exactly. So I guess I'm your target market. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but, but so, you know, we talked about agencies are one of your target markets. 
Elaine, how do you go after? Um, how do you how do you target your exist your, your your target accounts and and what have you found to be successful at onboarding new logos? I think one of the most underutilized sales tools and marketing tools is LinkedIn. And using that as a way, you know, there's in Sales Navigator, if you specialize in a certain type of software product, so like WordPress, if you're an agency and you build WordPress websites, you can filter what accounts, what companies use that software. Now, is yes. it going to be a 100% accurate? No, but right. it's going to get you a lead list that Absolutely. you can build on top of that. Yeah. and get in front of people. And so, you know, it, I think that's been our number one tool in marketing and sales and finding the clients that use Asana, that use Monday, that use HubSpot CRM. And so we just start drilling down what platforms do we specialize in? Now, the next step is to get in front of those companies that use them because a lot of them don't have everything put together. They've Absolutely. got the first step. Right, They're using right. something. <laughs> well, I think so often, um, in, as we talk about companies who have deployed software, you know, we often talk about they're only getting 25% use, 30% use out of the application because it cured one problem, but they never got curious to find out how many more others that it could be cured because it yeah. solved the need of the day. And so, you know, we look to see so many times there's so little software being implemented, um, but so much more opportunity. Consultants like you can be brought in and um, I think often, and the agencies don't know they have the need. They're just comfortable with the way they've done things all the time. And I'm sure you open the door of how much more efficient and effective they can become if they let these platforms take care more of the manual process than they're doing manually themselves today. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many benefits too. Like you said, like 20 to 30% usage. Most companies think I need to find a different platform. Right, they right, don't realize. Right. They have and, and I mean, I run into that within my own organization where they're like, you know, yeah. oh, let's go try this. I'm like, when we hit 100% usage of our current platform and it is not doing what we want, then we can go somewhere else. But right Graduate. now, yeah, we're not using everything. So we don't need to spend, change management is expensive. Yeah, you know, Changing yeah. software platforms data-wise is time expensive and training your team-wise is expensive. I, I've, always, I've always, this is probably really not a funny joke, but I've always said, you know, sometimes they say in marriage, divorce, <laughs> divorce is, you know, costs 50%. I think when it comes to platforms, divorce costs like 80% because it's so hard to divorce from a platform and it creates such a sticky stickiness of clients, not because they like it, it's because the cost and pain and risk to move off of it is more problematic in their mind than to continue to be displeased with the tools they're using. Mm -hmm. And so often, you know, we help, you know, we onboard a lot of new clients who have platforms that they don't like and we either help them re-implement that more effectively or we help them offload it, but we bring them some confidence that we can migrate it because I find so many companies feel victim to either bad software or more often I usually find poor implementation. Somebody just really didn't understand the requirements correctly and 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 they've been living with the bad implementation. It's not necessarily the platform was bad, just the way it was configured and trained was. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when professionals come in there and can reassure people that they can reapply those tools in a better way, they can get more efficient, but we're scared. We're scared because we're afraid if we leave that we're going to lose something or it's going to break something else. And it, it definitely fears prevents us from taking advantage of some sometimes. And it sounds like your company helps give people the confidence. It's okay to, to make these transitions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what we love doing, helping people better use those systems. And then the more knowledge the team has, the more productive they're going to be. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, just yeah. like we were talking about a second ago, it's, it's not just about the system improving. Like you were mentioning, um, the client doesn't care about the three hours that they spent trying to figure something out, right? They want the end result. Correct. And so when your team isn't spending those hours every day trying to dig through things, they can do the things that they enjoy doing, why they got that job exactly. and give better value to the client. And so every single time we start seeing the value, the lifetime value of the client go up. Yes. yes because yeah. the team can spend the time on servicing that client where that client cares instead yes. of fumbling through data configuration. Yes, abso so absolutely true. Uh, so, you know, you talk about you're doing this for these companies and really helping them in their in their digital transformation almost, I would say. But um, in that, um, any recent case studies or successes that you want to share with the audience? Yeah, gosh, we've had a couple of really, I mean, we're always getting good ones, but it's the ones we have a, a client right now, they just purchased an old company. 
they yeah. were printing out their emails and filing no. them. No, yes. no, their no. their scheduling book is a, and this is a um, contract, like a contractor. So this isn't even an agency, right? Right, they've right. Got, they're a contractor. They've got teams in the field that go and do repair work, and so they're they're printing out emails for the clients for the jobs, oh. and then their scheduling book is an actual book. Oh my gosh! I and didn't know that existed. The new owners, you know, the new owners are seeing this as an opportunity, right? Like this has been a a running company for 30 years. There's a ton of opportunity for efficiency here and to improve things and to actually grow. And so we've been working with them for about three months and just now they're moving at lightning speed. They're looking at purchasing another company to fold into that. Wow. Yeah. You know, I think that that's a great story. And I love, um, you know, sometimes I've thought, you know, um, you know, when, when a company gets operational excellence, it becomes a, a ripe um, opportunity for them to acquire others who haven't got that same operational excellence yet. And they may have good people and good customers, but they don't have operational excellence yet. I can only imagine as you help these companies get operational ex- excellence, it gives them an opportunity to, to grow not just organically, but inorganically through acquisitions as well. And we know often through your mergers and acquisitions, obviously the culture mix is always the, one of the most challenging to make sure that fits. But the platform mix is part of it as well. And I think with you know um, when you have operational excellence, you're, 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 you have a company that's trying to grow, um, you really can complement your organic growth strategy with an inorganic growth strategy and, and look for other good companies who don't have as well-run operations and grow and gain some um, advantages with that organization by leveraging the implemented technologies that you do for a living. Yeah. And I think it goes both ways. Like you're saying, like you could become this operationally efficient company and start acquiring companies, but you also, on the other side, if you get it to a place and it is a well to oil machine and you don't want to do that company anymore, you are in the perfect position to get acquired, to sell. Yes. Yeah. And you, when you have that in place, a lot of times owners get acquired and they have to stay on and work a job. Correct. When you can get yourself out and you aren't the linchpin keeping everything right, running, right. then you can actually sell your company and move on to doing something else. It's just a different, yeah, yeah, no, so well said. Um, Elaine, I, I know it was some of the products that you um, recommend that you have some free trials out there. Can you explain to the audience maybe what some of these free trials are? and how that would benefit some of them. It's like, you may, we have some audience members who may want to take advantage of some of that. Yeah, you know, like we were just saying with one of the, the things is a project management system. What project management system is right for the organization? A lot of right. times, you know, a company have tried two or three of them. They're using one, but they aren't well implemented into it at all. Right. And so the first thing is just, we call it the selector tool and it helps you, you answer 12 questions. It's super quick. It's less than two minutes okay. and it'll tell you which project management system is the best fit for you. And this is a proprietary questionnaire that you built yourself? Yep. And we, what we've done is we've done so many engagements with companies all over the world. We're, we're not just U.S. based. We, we worked with all, com- all countries all over and we have been able to distill it down to 12 main things to say out of these 12 things, what is important to you and how you run your organization. And we can tell you which project management system. So it's from our knowledge that we built this and then um, are are able to tell you that. So that's one of the free tools and that's on workdayninja.com. You just scroll down to resources and it's right there. And then the other thing we call it Willie, the workflow wizard. And, you know, you know, the first step that I was saying is, you know, to have a project management system in place, that's going to yep. be the heartbeat of your company. Yep. Then after that is how do all these other software platforms work together to reduce that manual work and what can be automated? So Willie, again, you answer, I think it's just eight questions on that. And it's a free tool. You answer those and it's just what software platforms do you use? Like what's your CRM? What's your invoicing software? All of this. And it'll tell you 25 automations that could be in place in your organization right now. Wow. Wow. Um, I am going to go to your website. I'm going to populate <laughs> both. And that this obviously is being recorded and any of my team who hears this, I think this 50% would be excited, 50% of like, don't you dare. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I think it'd be curious. You know, we're very deep in, in implementation from our, 
from our project management tool and our financial software and our CRM. Um, but I'd be curious just to see what yours explains and what we might be learned. And then certainly on the opportunity of 25 ways to be more efficient or effective too, I, I certainly would be curious to see. And I hope many of our audience is curious to go try that out too. I think um, you know, you never stop striving to find ways to be more effective and efficient. And um, I would say, be careful what you ask for, because when you get there, you'll change your mind. And, you know, we all think, <laughs> we, oh, I only hope we can get to here one day. I only get, well, when you get there, like, well, okay, well, we got here, but I, I'm not done growing. And I, I still, we've got, you know, so once you get there, you end up setting new goals. And I think, um, you know, what you're putting together just helps companies be able to have beliefs that they can become more effective and efficient. And then, spend their time what they like to do and not what they don't like to do. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. And, you know, sometimes employees start to get scared, like, oh, if they take away 50% of my job and it's automated, I'm going to lose my job. Like, actually, no. Are there other things that you want to be doing yes. to improve the company, like take care of clients or build better ads? Like you actually have the time. Yes. So it's yeah, not about absolutely. necessarily taking away your job completely. It's like, no, you actually get to focus on the good things. Yes. You know, the, the hard part of being in the agency sector, and this is like probably many of the professional services, no one got into professional services to want to record their time. But, <laughs> yeah. but it's a requirement of every professional services organization to record your time. No one got into being a web designer or search engine optimization expert or a software developer to want to have to populate, you know, a time card or, or, or do tasks, you know, do tasks, but but it's, it's part of what has to be done. Yeah. The more efficient you can make that, the more people can do what they did desire to do when they entered into an agency, the happier they're going to be, the better results clients will get. So I love what you do. Elaine, I've got two more questions for you. Okay. Uh, I ask every guest on the, on, the, on the podcast, have you ever had a mentor in life? And if so, how did they help you develop and grow? Yeah, I've had mentors throughout my life and some of it was really informal and I didn't even realize, you know, that that's what was happening. And and right. I always think about, I had two professors in college. And I, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background quickly to get to the point of my mentors. When yeah. I was in college, I was very young. I was 17 and I was going to finish my bachelor's in business yep. when I was 20 years old. And yep. I was like, man, I'm not even 21 and I'm going to finish college. Like I have a full ride. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to add a second bachelor's. I'm going to wow. do two at a time. And so I added an engineering degree and I just closed my eyes and I picked one randomly and said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add it on. And because I love math, I love math. And so I just thought, man, engineers get to do tons of math. So it's going to be great. Right. Well, and so I did and I added on and it, there just wasn't a lot of women in the in the engineering field. And it didn't it didn't bother me. But my I had two professors and. I wasn't the smartest engineer. I wasn't top of the class, but they were so, they taught me what opportunity is and showing up and how important being somebody that they could count on meant. And yeah. it changed my life because I wasn't going to be the smartest engineer. I didn't want to put in the time to be the smartest engineer. And, but I showed up and they knew they could count on me. And they would help me get scholarships because I, since I added a degree, it was going to take me five years. So that fifth right. year, um, they helped me get scholarships. They helped wow. me um, do presentations in front of organizations. And just really, I always think about what a change, you know, you hear stories like about mentors and a lot of times teachers, they end up being those yes. people. Yes, very and often. They made a huge difference because they believed in me and, you know, some other professors didn't. I was the only girl and I don't look like everybody else in the room. Right. And they told, they showed me I have a place and you just keep showing up. Wow. Yeah. What a great, what a great example. Um, and I like, you know, some of it's informal too. I shared my story on the podcast a few times before, but most of my mentorships were very informal in, in the in the interactions, but in the reflection back, it was my gosh, I'm so appreciative of those people. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have the ability to see through a different lens that they gave me an opportunity to see through. And I would say, you know, I had a, I had binoculars, but they made me have a telescope. And so they just gave me such a bigger target to be able to believe in myself and what our team could do that then, and, and, and gave me the confidence to, to think bigger and think broader and um, would share their insights and expertise. And so thankful 
And like yourself, Elaine, we've all had um, educators who've been part of those mentors and, and everything else. And whether it's formal or informal, we've seen mentors be you know great, great help to help people grow. Last question. Um, where do you get your inspiration from these days? Oh, gosh, I love listening to podcasts. One of my favorites is how I built this with Guy Raz. And yeah. so I love listening to entrepreneurs stories because what you realize is everybody suffers through building. Yes. Yep. You know, no one just had a unicorn overnight. It was years of grit and tears and absolutely not knowing what was going to happen tomorrow. And so those really help keep me voted, motivated on hard days. And I read a ton. I'm reading Outliers by Malcolm Gold, um, Gladwell right now. Yep. And, you know, just hearing, I used to have a different perspective on reading books and podcasts and different things where if it wasn't the most life-changing experience I ever had, I thought it was, I undervalued it. And huh. then my business partner one day was like, Elaine, if you just took one thing away to yeah. improve, like that is worth it. And, and it took me a little bit and I'm like, you know what? You're right. Like, it's all about baby steps and improving yes. yourself. Not everything is going to be this giant leap. Most things aren't because you don't have the concepts to put in yes. place there. Yeah. Well, and I, I I share that like your partner. I I always look for you know I say, I say a few incremental gains get significant lift, right? And so if we're looking for that one game changing idea, um, we may search for a long time, but um, a few incremental adjustments do make one light, leap leap size change too. So I always look, you know, what's the three to five nuggets I could get out of a podcast or uh, you know, get out of reading a book, and um, and I'm happy if I can walk out with three to five nuggets, and they may be incremental adjustments, but every incremental adjustment leads up to a larger adjustment as a whole. And so absolutely. So thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, podcasts are great and I appreciate you being a guest on ours. Uh, we've been talking to Elaine Boyd of Workshop Ninja. Elaine, you shared a lot today. You shared how people can get to take two questionnaires and get some, uh, some feedback. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Oh, I'm active on LinkedIn. Please connect with me on there. Let me know that they heard us from the podcast here. And that I'm always on there. So love to connect. Yeah, that's fantastic. Elaine, thank you so much. We appreciate you sharing your insights, your expertise, and you wish you ongoing success in your journey of growth. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Growth Fire podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.